Isn't it always good to be in God's house? Uh, now, some of you know uh, that have been here as I have ministered before, but this is going to be kind of new to some of you. But uh, I always, for some reason, this here is just something, something that the Lord dropped in my heart uh, or quite some time back. But uh, I always start with what I call the musings of a deaf man. Oh, I tell you what, it, it is uh, quite an adventure, quite a journey being, I don't even know what to call myself. Well, I'm, I'm deaf unless I put this thing on and then I can hear. So I guess you might call myself part-time deaf. <laughs> I hear in the day, but I don't hear at night. So all those trains that come through, I just sleep right through them. I don't have to worry about listening to all of that. But, but back to the musings of a deaf man. Now, there's several things that I have shared before in the past, um, how it would relate to being deaf and how that people out there that do not know the Lord are deaf. You see, you have to understand that we don't know what we don't hear. We don't have a clue what we're missing out on. And before we start judging people out there, we have to understand that they don't have a clue what they are missing out on. Let that sink in. We can be yelling at them. We can be hollering at them. We, we can be, I mean, with all of our might, but they don't know what they're not hearing. Okay, that's one aspect of a deaf person. Another aspect was someone like myself who has been cochlear implanted, and I can hear a lot of things, but I don't hear everything. And sometimes that's even worse than not hearing anything at all to those that are around me. Because there again, sometimes I let my pride get in the way. And I don't always ask for that second explanation. Did you say what I thought you said, because I'm going to tell you some of the things that I say back to people that this is what I thought I heard, or what they said is over here, and what I thought I heard was is over here. Okay, what's the problem with that? You still have a miscommunication. Okay, is it their fault or is it my fault? Who failed to get the clarification on that? <laughs> well, me. I didn't always follow through with saying, okay, what did you say? Now, while I'm saying all this, y'all all need to really, really pray for my wife because she's the one on the other end of this that has to repeat herself over and over and over and over again. The third thing, and this here is one that I have shared before, but it still bears repeating. Whenever you are speaking to a deaf person or a hard of hearing person, there's another thing that comes into play in the fact that it's not always more volume that is helpful. We are not looking for more volume. <laughs> Trust me, we are not looking for more volume. Whenever I say, what did you say, I don't need. I said, do this, do this, you know. 
That, that doesn't help me at all. What I do need is clarity. What I need is clarity, not volume. Okay, so think about the world. Think about those that are observing our Christian walk. Think about those that we are, are talking to and witnessing to and living in front of. Do they need more volume? Oh, let's crank up the volume. Let's, let's really just, just take the word. Let's just, just force it on them and give it to them. And every time we're talking to them, we're always giving them the scripture. We're always... Um, if what is in this and what we are doing in our everyday walk did not line up, they do not need more volume. They need more clarity. Are you with me? They need you, number one, to be transparent. Okay, look, I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers. I know where the, all the answers are. And I can give you those answers. But I, I'm not perfect. You need to understand that first and foremost. But secondly, you also need to understand that even though I have the answers, I am going to do my best to be walking as close to what the manual gives me. And if I don't do that, if there's a huge disconnect between what I say and what I do, then the world, the deaf people, if you will, are not going to hear what they need to hear. So that's my musings of a deaf person. That's not my message. That's just something that the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart of, uh, some time back whenever I was giving a word, and it just uh, just become something that I give out. Um, the musings of a deaf man. But I want to talk about something that goes along with, um, we've been talking about family, we've been talking about relationship, we've been talking about uh, how all of that works together and with uh, um, our relating to one another. And, you know, I just want to take a moment just to break that word down just a little bit. Relationship. Whenever we talk about relationship, a lot of times we, you know, we talk about how, how well we know someone or, or how well we interact with someone. But the very uh, root of relationship is relating. Relating. How do we relate to that person? Or how does that person relate to me? What is the common ground? What is the thing that, that we find in common? What, what is the thing that we, that we can, can address that can bring us closer together, that we can relate one with another? So that's how a relationship gets started, is you find that common ground. But then it doesn't stop there. You see, a relationship not only gets started, but a relationship has to be nurtured if it's going to continue. And that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where it's sometimes difficult for us to continue those relationships uh, if we come to a place that there is a disconnect or if we come to a place that we no longer relate, if we come to a place that we uh, stop uh, nurturing the relationship, then that relationship is going to go sour. Right? Now, we talk about relationships among ourselves, 
But then we also, because we're in the setting of coming to study the Word of God and to know more about Him and to know more about our relationship with the Lord, we can see from what we have just sang that no matter what our end of the relationship has been, He has always been faithful. He has always been there for us. He has always given us the help that we need, even whenever we didn't deserve it. He has always given us the grace that we need, even whenever we are, are in the lowest point of our lives. All my life, he's been faithful. All my life, he's been so good to me. So, what does the scripture say about our relation to him? It says we love him because he first loved us. Think about that. We love him because he first loved us. We recognize that that love was there. So, here's some things I want to talk about this, this morning. How's your heart? How is your heart? Well, you take someone who uh, has, has been to the hospital, they've had open heart surgery, or, or they need open heart, heart surgery, they've got some heart problems, right? <laughs> they've got some things that need to be fixed. They've got some things that need to be rectified, that need to be uh, cleaned out, some stent put in, some, some bypass it done so we can get around the problem. Sometimes in our life, we have the same thing. We have things that need to be gone around. We have things that need to be dug out. We have things that need to be cleaned. We have things that, that, that need to be taken away. So, uh, in Matthew 6, 21, the word says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Pastor Pam, so a lot of, some of the things that I am going to be bringing out are things that she has already built upon. But one of the things that she has brought out is how can you tell where a person's heart is? How can you tell what's in a person's heart? How can you tell, uh, uh, you know, what, what a person's priorities are? Well, the answer to that is where do they spend their time, their treasures, and their talent. Okay? That, that part has, has been established. Where do they spend their time, their treasures, and their talent? Now, there's another scripture. I didn't put it down here, and I don't know the reference for it at the moment. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, a lot of times, have you ever been in that situation where all of a sudden, either out of your mouth or out of somebody else's mouth, came the bold, honest, raw truth, but it came out in such a way you... Did I say that out loud? Now, psychologists call that a Freudian slip. <laughs> but the Word of God says if it's in there, it's going to come out. Out of the abundance. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Well, no, you might not have meant to say it out loud in that situation. But if it's in there, it's going to come out. So, a lot of times, we don't even know what all is in our heart. The Bible says, for the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? You see, we don't even know ourselves sometimes the way that we think we do. That's why we have to have the Holy Spirit to illuminate us. 
That's why we have to have the Holy Spirit to shine his light upon us and, and put the spotlight on us so that, that those things that are in our hearts that need to be removed, that need to be bypassed, that need to be fixed can come to light. Have you ever been around someone who, you know, before they had their open heart surgery, I mean, they were just always so tired, so sluggish, and so, you know, just always hurting and always in a bad mood and just, just. And then after they had their surgery, after everything, well, my goodness, you would have thought you were talking to a new person. Because now they're just going and going, and, and they feel better, and they're happy-go-lucky, and and everything is is a whole different picture than what you had before. How's your heart? Do you need heart surgery? Do you need your life to be changed in that way? Now, I know that whenever we come to the Lord and, and we give our heart and life to him, that at that point, we become his child, and he begins to working on us. But then there's also that thing we still have to deal with called human nature. That we begin to allow the Holy Spirit through the Word of God to continue to pick out things and hold things up to light and say, oh, we don't need that anymore. Okay, so where's your heart? What do you think about? What do you talk about? What do you dwell on? What, what's your, your uh, priority? Whenever you go to talk about a conversation about things, are you digging through the trash or are you digging through the treasure? Are you looking at the past or are you looking at the future? Are you looking at the negative or are you looking at the positive? Are you, are you going dump to diving or are you going treasure seeking? How's your heart? How do you know what's in your heart? By what comes out your mouth. Pure and simple. You take a lemon and you squeeze it, what's going to happen? Lemon juice is going to be squeezed out of that lemon. So what's in there is going to come out of there. So now we all occasionally, we make bad choices. Proverbs 18.12 gives us this. Says before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty or proud, and before honor is humility. Now, Pastor Pam talked about this whenever she was talking about humility. But I want to look at the pride part. Before destruction, the heart of a man is proud. Now, a lot of times we we dress pride up. To make it look like it's not so bad. But one of the biggest things that God said he hates is a proud look. Now, I'm not full blood Indian, but I've got enough in me that I know how us Native Americans can be, and I know how a lot of those, the tribal slogans are, the proud people of the Cherokee, the proud people of the Chickasaw, the proud people of the Choctaw. Well, you don't have to be Indian to be proud. That pride can get you in a lot of trouble. Let me show you what kind of trouble pride gets us into. Now, what's in our heart often becomes revealed through the means of conflict. So how do you deal with conflict? What, what's the thing that, that you do whenever you're faced with con 
conflict. Well, Pastor Pam, talk, she talked about the fight or flight. She talked about how we deal with conflict based on our personality, based on whether or not we are aggressive or if we're, we're passive or if we're passive aggressive. You know, those things have a lot to do with how we deal with conflict. But let's look at this. Conflict presents a choice. Choice brings about a change. Change affects community, which is everybody around us. And then the more community you have, then you have the more opportunity for more conflict. So where's the win-win there? The win-win in that situation is that we eventually, hopefully, learn how to deal with conflict in the godly manner. Amen? Now, do we always ace that test? No. We wish we did. We wish we could say, every time I'm deal, I'm, I, I have conflict brought against me, I pass that test with flying colors. No, we're still in school, folks. We're still in this school called life, and as we live. But the key thing is to keep learning. So Proverbs tells us a lot about conflict resolution. But it also tells us a lot about two different types of people and how they deal with different things. And before I can get to the one, I have to kind of wade through the other. So I'm going to talk about what Proverbs talks about a whole lot. And, uh, you know, Proverbs is an excellent, excellent, excellent book for practical living. Now, it's not one that you just, you know, hop on it like the book of Matthew and just read through it, and it all continues and it tells a story. No, Proverbs is broken up into little bite-sized pieces, okay? So you can take these little pieces and just chew on them and maul on them and think about them and, and apply them to your life. And as you continue to do this, and as you continue to seek after wisdom, then God will begin to work on these things in your heart. But let's talk about the fool and how to avoid being one. There's four steps of a fool. And it all begins with pride. 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 Pride, or well, even that conflict that we were talking about. The Word of God says only, now get this, only by pride comes contention. Anytime you have conflict, anytime there's a dissension, anytime there's contention, anytime that there's an argument, it's because of pride. How is that? I'll tell you how it works. I want to be right. <laughs> and you want to be right. And so I'm going to defend my case, and you're going to defend your case. And we're going to have what's called an argument, right? How do we end this argument? One of us has got to finally come to the point. Or both of us have finally got to see that, hey, the only way we're going to get anywhere is by, number one, stepping out of our pride, and number two, look for a solution instead of hashing out the problem. And that's called compromise. That's called meeting at a middle ground, but that is not going to happen as long as I keep saying I'm right and you keep saying I'm right. 
what causes us to hang on to that so strongly, what causes us to be so strong about our opinion that nothing is going to move us or shake us. Now, I'm not talking about when it comes to God's Word, but I'm talking about our own feelings, our own opinions. There's always a solution to the problem, but the problem is not going to be rectified until we at first address the pride. We have to address the pride to begin with. So, there's different steps of being a fool. Proverbs 14, 15 gives us the simple fool. A simple man believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. Now, have you ever seen one that was just flat out gullible? I mean, you could trick them into everything. Have y'all not ever seen somebody like that? And, and, and all you have to do is go, you know, tell them, hey, go down yonder. There's, there, there's something waiting for you. Oh, here they go. You know, there's not anything down there waiting for them. But, you know, this, this kind of stuff, it starts whenever they're small. You find that kid that everybody likes to pick on, everyone, uh, you know, that, that one that's gullible. How does that happen? It's because they believe every word, and they don't take the time to consider, okay, now, if I do this or if I do that, what's going to be the end result? You see, one of the things that we try our best to teach our boys is the fact that choices have consequences. Choices have consequences. So whenever we make that choice and we believe anything and everything, then it's easy for anyone to pull the wool over our eyes, to fool us, to trick us. Okay, let's take that a little bit step forward. The Bible says in the book of James, for us not to be deceived, easily swayed, like a ship without a rudder, driven with the wind and tossed, to be double-minded, because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What is that? That's a person who will believe everything that they're, that they're told. That's a person that can, let me put it to you this way, that's a person that can watch religious television all day long and then wind up being as confused as a, I don't know what, what do we say, a termite and a yo-yo? <laughs> Why? Because... They take everything that they have heard all day long and they have no discernment to know what's right and what's wrong. That's a fool. That's someone who is gullible. That's someone who does not take full account of everything, of all the information that is there. So, we become gullible whenever we are too proud to ask the right kind of question in order to get the whole story, or when we assume that we know all the answers already. Okay, number two, there's a stupid fool. A stupid fool is one who repeats foolish behavior over and over. Proverbs 26, 11. It says, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. So what does he do? Number one, he trusts in his own heart. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Someone who continues on you know, you've heard that definition of insanity. 
It's whenever we keep doing the same thing over and over, but we expect different results. That's the foolish thing to do. What does the word tell us also about, you know, you take a, a, a sum of money and, and you give it to a fool, and, and it's like putting money in bag with holes in it. Why? Because they're just going to go out there and spend it on everything, and squander it, and it's going to be gone, and, and, and there's no seed left. So, what else? Proverbs 18, 2. A fool is always talking but never listening. A fool has no delight in understanding. He doesn't want to listen to you. He doesn't want to take any advice from you. All he wants to do is express his own opinion. All he wants to do is be the one controlling the conversation. All he wants to do is be the one that, that has the loudest voice. All he wants to do is be the one that, that is just giving and giving and giving. You can't tell them over you can't tell them anything over what they are just spewing out their mouth. Always talking, never listening. The Bible says that is a fool. Okay. But the, again, the root cause of all that is pride. Pride. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about mine. Uh-huh. I forget who sang that old song, but anyway. I want to be the one giving all the answers. I want to be the one doing all the, the, the giving out. So, now, that fool who finds no pleasure in understanding but delights in speaking his own opinion, he is driven by pride. But let me ask you something. Does this only ap apply to sinners and worldly people? No. No, it doesn't. You see, we have propagated a whole um, religion, and we call it Christianity because we are followers of Christ, right? But we call ourselves followers of Christ, but we don't always follow in his ways. Let me give you an example. We have erroneous, erroneously perpetuated a doctrine that we are rewarded by our righteousness and our morality. We are above the sinner because we're righteous and they're not. We live good, clean lives and they don't. We go to church and we have our fine sense of community here, and, and uh, we meet with everyone. But, you know, them people out there, that, that they're out there fishing on Sunday. They're out there hunting, and they're out there, you know, just doing their thing. Never go to God's house. Never uh, darken the church doors. Somehow, we have got this idea that we're better than they are. Ouch. What's the cause of that? What is that call? What does the Bible say in the book of James whenever we come together and, and you have someone that comes in your church and they're dressed real nice. They got on the three-piece suit. They got on the, the, the nice shine shoes. And you say to that person, oh, come on, come on, come on. We've got a seat for you right up here. Sit down, brother. Sit down. God bless you. Oh, nice watch. I like that, brother. Cool. And then you have someone who comes in off the street that doesn't have all of those things. And you say, oh, sit, sit back here somewhere where nobody will see you. Now, I'm so thankful 
I'm going to say this right now, right now for the record. I am so thankful that we are not that way at Christian Gathering. I'm thankful that this is the how that we say, come as you are. Come in the house, brother. Come on in. Find yourself a place. I don't care. Up here, front seat, back seat, middle seat. It doesn't matter. We're going to sing our song that says, come to the altar. We want you to come all the way to the front. But there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of churches out there that it's not that way. And that's called religion. Jesus never asked for a religion. He wants a relationship. Yeah. And the thing that he said that would be the defining factor <coughs> is not your righteousness and their unrighteousness, whether you was a saint and they were a sinner. No. He said, it's the proud that I resist. But I give grace to the humble. Amen. I don't care how holy you think you are. I don't care how righteous you think you present yourself just because you can put on a three-piece suit and go to church. That does not make you righteous. That does not make you holy. Number one, it's not our righteousness to begin with. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And anyone who has come to him and has accepted him is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they smell like. I don't care what part of town they come from. God resists the proud. He pushes them away, but he gives grace to the humble. Then there's a stubborn fool. A stubborn fool is one that's always right in his own eyes, Proverbs 12, 15. So I'm going to ask you again while he's putting that up, check your heart. How's your heart? The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. A fool's anger, a fool's wrath is known at once. I mean, they're just, boom, quick to anger. But a prudent man covers shame. You know, there's another scripture that talks about how that we are supposed to behave ourselves. And we are the, the, the admonition is given for us to be slow to anger. Slow to speak. If you're a hothead and you can get mad at the drop of a pen, then you need to consider what the Word of God says about your heart and about your condition. Are you a prudent man or does that put you in the category of a fool? Are you right in your own way? Are you right in your own eyes? Do you always have to be right no matter what? Another thing about a stubborn fool is that they despise wisdom and discipline. They stir up trouble. They're quick to argue. Proverbs 12, 16. Okay, that's, well, that's, we have it here. A fool's wrath is known at once. Proverbs 27, 3 tells us that a stubborn fool is one that is always trying to stir the pot, so to speak, poke the bear, start an argument, start a fight. A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but a fool's anger, a fool's wrath is heavier than both of those. There's a fourth kind of a fool, and that is a scorner. Completely ruled by arrogance. 
Proverbs call this fool a mocker or a scorner. And there's, if you want to take some time to read through the book of Proverbs or just, just do a word study on that scorner, you will find many, 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 many scriptures about the scorner in the book of Proverbs. But I'm going to give you one that says that they are adverse to wisdom. Proverbs 14, 6. They reject wisdom. A scoffer seeks wisdom and does not find it, but knowledge is easy to him who understands. Now, why is that? What would happen if you gave wisdom to that simple fool? You know, chances are that in their simplicity, they might just receive it, and they might just change their ways. Or even if you gave wisdom to the fool that goes back and repeats his behavior over and over, there's still some teachableness there. You can even talk to a stubborn fool, and even though they're stubborn now, it's going to be harder for them to receive it. But you show them the wisdom of, of, of God's Word, and, and sometimes that shell of stubbornness over time can be broken down. But you take a scorner and a mocker. That's someone who has been molded in that hardness of his heart for so long that even whenever he comes to the place that he tries to seek after wisdom, he's blind to it. It won't sink in. It's like the sower that went forth to sow and some of the, feet, the seed fell on the stony ground. What does it do? It bounces off. It will not sink in. It will not grow. The seed will be wasted, if you will. So, check your heart. Number one, are you foolish? Number two, at what point, if you are foolish, where are you at on this, this uh, timeline? What about your circle around you? What about your circle of influence? In Proverbs 20, verse 10, it tells us to cast out the scoffer, and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. Did you know that... Now, I know that we have, you know, certain things, family and, and work relationships and whatnot that, that we are, are put into. But the people you choose to spend your time with, the people you choose to allow into your circle of influence is a very, very, very important choice. And if you are in a relationship or if you are in a friendship or if you have this person or persons in your circle of influence that are scoffers and mockers and, and are hard-hearted and reject the truth and they will not listen and all they want to do is make fun of, of God, make fun of religion, make fun of, of, of the Word of God, the Bible says cast out the scoffer. And contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. You need to be careful who your circle is, who your friends are, who you hang around with. Okay, so let's talk about the hard issues. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, we had to wade through all of the, the foolish part so we could get to the good part. 
you see, if it were all just about fools and stubbornness and idolatry and, and wickedness and rebellion and all of those things, let me ask you this. If you went to the doctor and you had heart trouble, would you get mad at the doctor for telling you that you had heart trouble? But you wouldn't get mad at him for telling you that. But if that's all he told you, if he didn't give you any kind of, well, what can we do about this? Well, I don't know. All I can tell you is you have heart tr heart problem. Well, can it be big? Well, I don't know. Then you might have a tendency to get a little, okay, you call yourself a cardiologist and you don't know what to do about my heart. So what I'm saying to you is before you get upset with me about the first part of this message, hang on so you can get the last part, okay? Because we're going to show you something, how that we can get out of that. Now, the, the natural heart has four chambers, okay? The little heart that we see on Valentine's Day, that's not what a heart looked like. I'm sorry. But the blood pumping muscle that you see has four chambers in it. But so does our spiritual heart have four chambers. Now, for the kin, you're going to like this because it has an acronym. I know you love acronym. Okay? So the four chambers of our spiritual heart is called W. I S E. Wise. What have we been talking about? Wisdom or the lack of all this wisdom. So we can fix our heart problem by being wise. W I S E. The W stands for the will. The will. The will is the chamber of our choices. Okay, because all of our actions, everything we do, foolish or prudent, is preceded by a will. Our actions are preceded by a choice. Now, I wish I knew and could get it in the right order. But there's a saying, and I think uh, Pastor James brought this uh, particular saying up a few weeks ago. But your attitudes determine your choices. Your choices determine your habits. Your habits determine your lifestyle. And your lifestyle determines your destiny. So your destiny all goes back to your choice. So where does your choice take place? It takes place in the will. I will. I will do this. I will do that. God says, okay, there's a problem with that. What you need to say is if God will, then I will go into this city tomorrow and I'll buy and sell. I'll do this and this and this. If God will. But whenever we come to the place where we say, I will, I will, I will. And it's in, a, 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 it's in the, the standpoint of being proud. I'm the one. You know, the, the old uh, poem that we learned way back there in English literature. I am the master of my ship. I am the captain of my fate. Remember that one? Or how about Frank Sinatra? I did it my way. Okay, there's a problem with that. We're, because we're lifting up man. We're lifting up ourselves. We're putting ourselves on the throne instead of relinquishing our will to God's will and letting him be on the throne of our lives. 
So surrendering our choices, which is all in the chamber of the will, means surrendering our will. So we change from I can to I can't, but he can. Amen. Now, that's not to say that we do not have good Godfidence, as Pastor Pam put it a week or so ago. We need to know who we are in Christ. We need to exhibit a good self-esteem. We need to know who we are that we can say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. But whenever we leave that out and we just say, I can do all things, then that's a problem. We're falling back on that old pride crutch again. <clears throat> the will, the intellect, the intellect is the chamber of our thoughts. Our thoughts, Second Corinthians ten five it says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, you know as well as I do that there are times that, that, that our mind, our thoughts just take a, a beeline off over into the left field somewhere. You know, we might be working, we might be doing something, all of a sudden we find ourselves thinking and we find ourselves, you know, in this, this mental conversation with somebody that's not even there. And, and then pretty soon we, why am I thinking all this? That's whenever we have to bring every thought into captivity. We have to pull down those strongholds, pull down those vain imaginations, pull down those things that the enemy keeps bringing up, pull down those, all the stuff in our past that is exactly where it needs to be in the past. Quit letting those things haunt you and, and, and come up over and over and over. We need to bring those thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Cast down those vain imaginations. And then the will, the intellect, the spirit is the S. And that's the chamber of our prayers. The chamber of our relationship with the Lord. The spirit. We meet him in the spirit. James 1 and 5 says, asking wisdom of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, the regular King James, instead of saying without reproach, it says he upbraideth not. What does that mean? That means God did not beat you over the head with something. He did not condemn you for asking over and over again. He did not say, well, you know, I tried to tell you before and you, you know, went the wrong way. No. He does not hang those things over our head. But every time, whenever we come to him and we say, Lord, I I'm trying my best to do better. And I need your wisdom. I am trying to put away this pride issue I have. And I am doing my best to not be a fool, but to be a prudent man, to walk uprightly before you. And I need your wisdom. I like what it says. It says, he gives to all men. And men means mankind, so men and women. All liberally. Liberally. That means in great proportion. Now, sometimes we may think, well, Lord, I asked for, for wisdom last week and I didn't seem to do any better. Well, there again, whose fault is that? Is that his or is that yours? You see, this is the message that we have to take it to the mirror. 
and say, okay, let's look ourselves in the eye and say, where am I? How's my heart? What, what's in there that still needs to be changed? What's in there that I still don't even know about? How can I make the choices, have the thoughts, and pray the prayers that I need to pray in order to see God change my life? Okay, the chamber of our prayers. You know, Jesus gave us a pattern. He gave us the Lord's Prayer. Many of us are familiar with it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but... Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the glory and the honor forever. Now, that's a powerful prayer. Now, we can make a formality of it, or we can look at it and say, what's really there? Well, there's a pattern here. And there's another acronym, Brother Ken, called PRAYS, P-R-A-Y-S. First of all, we praise him. We acknowledge that he is holy, that he is the one true and holy God. We come to him for renewal. We ask him to renew us, and by renewing us, we're asking his kingdom to come in this temple, in this heart, in this clay, in this world. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, how is his will done in heaven? Well, I'm pretty sure that whenever he gives a thought or a command or whatever, I mean, the angels hop right to it and it's done. Right? Wouldn't, would you, wouldn't you imagine that's how it's done in heaven? Well, he wants us to be that receptive and that obedient to him. So that whenever he can use us in a way that whenever his will says, I want you to do this, you say, I'm ready. I'll do it. My will is surrendered to your will. My heart is your heart. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Ask. He said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. For here, ask, give us this day our daily bread. What do we have need of? What do we have need of? You know, one of the biggest problems we have, and again, it goes back to pride, folks. We have not because we ask not. Why don't we ask? What keeps us from asking? We just sang earlier about how, what a good, good father he is and how faithful he's been to us. And, and all of our life, he's been so, so, so good to us. And yet we are afraid to come boldly before the throne of grace. Well, fear. Fear and pride, which fear is born out of pride. Why, do we, why are we afraid to approach him? Fear of rejection. Fear that he might say no. Fear that we might not get what we want. Fear that, that he's going to somehow in us condemn us for, for asking for what we need. No, he told us to. He wants us to. 
And then why? Yield. And in that yielding to the Spirit, we forgive. We forgive as we forgive others. So, one scripture says, freely you have received, freely give. But here it says, we forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That little word as two little letters is a powerful word. In the same measure that you give, that's the same measure you will receive. Well, that's talking about giving and receiving. Okay, let's add to that. In the same measure that you forgive, is going to be the same measure that you are forgiven of others. So, do you have a forgiving spirit? Or are you still hanging on to that pride and being foolish in saying, you know, I just, uh, I just don't really want to forgive that person. And go ahead, drink that poison. Because whenever you drink that poison, it's not going to hurt the other person. All that poison of bitterness is going to do is hurt you, kill you. Surrender. Now, we talked about the chambers of the spiritual heart, the will, the intellect, the spirit. And the E is emotions. The chamber of our emotion. Now, emotions come in four main categories. Mad, sad, glad, or afraid. Now, there's a whole bunch of other emotions that, that we can experience a little, but you can put most of those emotions in those four categories. You're either mad about something, you're sad about something, you're glad about something, or you're afraid. Those are the four dominating and controlling emotions that we have. Okay, now, here's the problem with emotion. If we're not very, very careful, the chamber of the emotions in our heart can be the one that dominates the other three. Because we can allow our emotion to affect our will. We can allow our emotion to affect our thoughts. We can allow our emotion to affect even our spirit. So, it's highly important that we have, number one, we have all these other chambers surrendered to the will of God. Father, I give you my will. I, I, I bring the, all those thoughts down to the, to the knowledge of Christ and casting down those vain imaginations. Father, I give you my prayers. I'm asking wisdom of you. I praise you. I'm asking for renewal of my heart, renewal of my mind, renewal of my thoughts, renewal of, of my spirit. And I'm asking you to make me like you. Amen. Father, I ask you Amen. to give me what I need so I can keep myself under check, that I can keep my heart upon you, that I can set my affections upon you and not on the things of this world, that I can keep my eyes where they need to be. And Father, please help me to keep my emotion surrendered to you. Now, we know that we have a will 
We know we have intellect. We know we have a spirit. And we also know that we have emotion. Now, emotions are not a bad thing. God made us to be emotional people. He created us that way for a reason, for a purpose. But he also designed that we should learn to keep our emotion under control. That's the key word. See, the Bible says, let your moderation be known to all men. Well, a lot of times we think, oh, well, that means, you know, it, maybe if I just do this a little bit or do that just a little bit, you know, uh, I don't just go all out on it, but I, you know, just a little bit. Well, moderation. Even the word moderate, to moderate something, that's your cruise control. What does your cruise control do? Well, it moderates your accelerator. Okay. You keep it on whenever you want to keep it, your vehicle at a certain speed or within a certain range. Now, whenever you're going downhill, yeah, it's going to let off so that you can maintain the same speed. If you're going to the Arbuckle and you got that long heel, I mean, it's going to give it some more gas drop down into another gear, but the speed is still going to be about the same. Are you with me? Because you're moderated, you're controlled, you're governed. That's what God wants us to do with our emotion. He wants us to feel the emotion he wants to experience the emotion. He wants us to have the emotion. But he also wants to teach us how to govern in them. How do we do that? Well, we turn it over to our spiritual cruise control. And we let the Holy Spirit be our governor. Amen. There's a, a scripture in the Old Testament that says, Set a watch before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. So when is it easiest for us to say something hurtful to someone else? Well, Whenever we are mad, sad, or afraid, when is it the easiest for us to laugh about something? Oh, that's when we're glad. That's a good emotion. But have you ever been around somebody that you couldn't have a normal conversation with them because all they want to do was joke around and then just, just joke, 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 joke. Well, that's funny for a while. But after a while, it grates on your nerves. After a while, the funny is not funny anymore. After a while, you begin to see that this person is simple-minded. This person has a one-track mind. This person doesn't know how to carry on a normal conversation. Now, are they glad? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Or they might be like Robin Williams. Whenever he said, I covered up all the depression, all the pain, all the heartache with humor. Did you know that there's a lot of people that do that? 
So what needs to happen? Number one, they need to bring all of these things under subjection. Surrender all of that to the Lord. So out of all the chambers of the heart, the emotions are the least to be trusted. Well, how do I keep my emotions in check? How do I keep my emotions uh, moderated? You have to first be sure that your will is surrendered. Your intellect is surrendered. Your prayer life is surrendered. And that's how you keep your emotion in check, governed. There is a way that seems right to a man. But that way leads to death and destruction. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You know, there's a reason why even in all of the the translating of the words you know why why did we not say you need to ask the Lord to come into your liver or your spleen or even your lungs because he gave us the breath of air That wasn't what he asked for. He asked for your heart. And the reason why he asked for your heart is because that's where the, the will, yep. the intellect, yep. the spirit, and the emotion reside. Oh, not, not in the blood pumping muscle but in in your heart in your heart so i pray that this has been a blessing i pray that this has been a lesson that we can all learn not to be a fool not to be stubborn not to allow pride to guide our lives and, and overtake our lives. But to let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable to God. Acceptable. For us to be moderated by the Holy Spirit for us to experience all the things that he wants us to experience. You know, we do, we, we go through times of being mad. We go through times of being sad. And we go through times of being afraid. We go through times of being glad. But let us be wise enough to not allow our emotion to be the thing that runs our life. Don't allow our emotion to be the thing that governs our choices, that governs our thinking, but rather we bring all those things, all of those four categories under subjection to the knowledge of the Lord. So Father, right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit has been helping us and has been shining a spotlight upon us. Lord, each one of us individually, help us especially to lay down our pride and have the fortitude to ask you, Father, how is my heart? How is my life? How is, is the projection that I give to the world and to those around me? What do others see that I do not see, Father? Show me. 
Show me where I need to change. Show me where I need to walk closer to you. Show me where my spirit need to come into more agreement with your word. Help me, Father, to follow after your ways with a pure heart, with clean hands, and Lord, that we would seek after wisdom, seek after knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Help us to seek your face, to seek your will, to seek your way. In Jesus' name, amen.